I want to thank you all for coming to the out tonight for the um, spring Judaic Studies lecture. We do one in the fall and one in the spring. Because this is uh, the 50th anniversary of Vatican II, and uh, we decided to do something focusing on Vatican II, uh, the university itself, our department, a much larger conference is coming up very soon, focusing on other aspects of Vatican II. But tonight we're going to talk about uh, the document of Vatican II dealing with the relationship of uh, the Catholic Church and the Jews. And uh, we really have two outstanding, internationally renowned speakers with us tonight. We're doing something we haven't done before. Each speaker is going to give a short presentation, and then and one will speak and follow by the other, and then we'll do it a second time, and then we'll have time for some questions, uh, focusing from the Catholic perspective, because when you speak about the Catholic-Jewish relations, you have to look at the Catholic perspective, how that has changed, and also the Jewish side as well. Starting, opening up, and uh, you all have this page, is... Uh, uh, Dr. Phil Cunningham from uh, St. Joseph's University. I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read you all, all the uh, accolades and uh, positions that our speakers hold, but let me just tell you that in addition to uh, teaching at, the, at St. Joseph's, he's director of the Institute for Jewish-Catholic Relations. He's also president of the International Council of Christians and Jews, and uh, you know uh, his bibliography and uh, his uh, achievements. Uh, he could be here for another five, ten minutes speaking about it. So without any further ado, let me first call on uh, Dr. Phil Cunningham. Thanks. So good evening. It's nice to be here at the Sister Jesuit University in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, uh, what we're going to do uh, is, uh, as um, was just explained, is I'll begin by speaking a little bit about the before and after, why no storytate is important. Um, my colleague and friend, uh, Rabbi Dr. David Berger, will do something similar from a Jewish perspective. And then we're going to uh, each speak about the topic of covenant, which has proven to be a very significant theological uh, term in terms of the conversation that has begun between Catholics and Jews over the last 50 years or so. Um, let me begin, because I find with, with our students at St. Joseph's that without, uh, without an awareness of the prehistory before the Second Vatican Council, that its true impact is, um, is not easy to detect. So I want to present three examples of the way that the Catholic Church and the Catholic community, more or less worldwide, uh, understood the religious status of Jews before the Second Vatican Council. I'll give two examples that are quotations, uh, then I'll say a few more things about Nostra Aetate itself. I want to conclude this opening portion with some visuals, which I think will also show the before and after. So um, generally, I think it's fair to say that the Catholic Church before 1965 and the issuance of this declaration on the relationship of the church to non-Christian religions held that Jews had been replaced as God's chosen people by the church, by Christianity. Um, there were several reasons argued over the centuries for this, an essential one linked uh, the death of Jesus to Jewish culpability, also a so-called rejection of Jesus by Jews, both past and, and down through the centuries, resulted in God cursing Jews, scattering them over the face of the earth, uh, never destined to disappear, but sort of as an object lesson of what happens to people who reject God. And that general package, which we could tease out the details of, it's often called replacement theology because the church replaces Israel or the people of Israel as God's chosen ones. Sometimes it's called supersessionism, which is a good Scrabble word, but I don't know beyond that where it originated, but from supersedere, to sit upon, to supersede. Um, so uh, two quotations that uh, some of the room will be very familiar with. Um, this is an example from Pope St. Pius X, January of 1904 who was visited, uh, gave an audience at the Vatican to Theodore Herzl, who was the founder, uh, one of the main leaders of the Zionist movement to establish a Jewish homeland um, in the ancestral uh, land of Israel. And when he met with the Pope to ask for his endorsement of this project, the, according to Herzl's diary, Pius X responded as follows, quote, the Jews have not recognized our Lord, therefore we cannot recognize the Jewish people. The Jewish religion was the foundation of our own, but it was superseded, there's the word, by the teachings of Christ, and we cannot concede it any further validity. That's a very important phrase. 
The Jews, who ought to have been the first to acknowledge Jesus Christ, have not done so to this day. And so, if you come to Palestine and settle your people there, we shall have churches and priests ready to baptize all of you. End quote. In other words, he rejected Herzl's appeal for assistance. Jumping ahead a few decades to 1938, Pope Pius XI, who um, was uh, the pope during the time of the rise of fascism in Italy. There's a fabulous book out on that topic recently by David Kurtzer called The Pope and Mussolini. Um, and also, of course, the rise of Nazism in Germany in the 1930s. Um, had... Um, commissioned several Jesuits to prepare a draft of an encyclical, an official papal document, that he intended to issue. It was never actually promulgated. Pius died, um, and the project was scuttled. Uh, David Kurtzer's book has some interesting revelations about that process. But this gives, I think, a nice sort of a snapshot of the theology of the day. Here's what the draft, again, I want to score, it's not an official document, but it kind of as the general atmosphere. It begins by lamenting the fact that millions of Jewish persons, quote, are deprived of the most elementary rights and privileges of citizens, as was happening under the Nazis. It went on to declare that, quote, the savior was rejected by that people, violently repudiated and condemned as a criminal by the highest tribunals of the Jewish nation, end quote. So you see the connection to a, a kind of corporate Jewish guilt for all time, um, with the crucifixion. And therefore, the draft continued, the Jews were doomed, quote, to perpetually wander over the face of the earth and have been preserved through the ages into our own time. Consequently, there is, quote, a historic enmity of the Jewish people to Christianity, creating a perpetual tension between Jew and Gentile, end quote. The church, says the draft, has had to guard against, quote, the spiritual dangers to which contact with the Jews can expose souls. That's a, I want you to remember that phrase. The church has had to guard against the danger, the sort of contamination of talking with Jews. This danger, quote, not diminished in our own time, was the authentic basis of the social separation of the Jews from the rest of humanity, end quote. Thank goodness this document was never promulgated in this form, if it had been promulgated at all, because Hitler would simply say, as he was already saying, I'm just doing church policy. So that's the before. And again, this is not a needle in a haystack kind of selection of text. This is everywhere. So the Second Vatican Council radically changes that. The document Nostra Aetate, um, I think, and you can refer to the handout here now, is arguably the most celebrated of the 16 documents of the Second Vatican Council. There are annual conferences and lectures and commemorative services of one sort or another in many parts of the world. And this year, being the 50th anniversary, is going to be particularly uh, fulsome in that regard. Um, I think, however, rather than go into the document itself, it's a very short text, and we're looking really this evening only at chapter 4 or section 4, which the longest section, it's still only 16 sentences or something, excuse me, dealing with uh, relations with the Jewish community. But I want to suggest to you that, that another indicator of the influence of this document has been what has happened since. That um, there are sometimes debates among scholars as to whether this word or that word in the document itself from 1965 had this meaning or did the authors intend it to be taken in such and such a way. These are all interesting discussions, but actually there has evolved a whole body of church documentation springing from Nostra Aetate that I think is how it is supposed to be understood or how we ought to understand it. So if you look at the side that has this chart, I'm going for the Guinness Book of World Records, greatest number of text boxes on a single word document page, but the shaded documents indicate, do, uh, the shaded boxes indicate specific documents. So you see Nostra Aetate 4 at the top, but it was followed in 1965 after the, excuse me, 1974 um, after the establishment of a commission for religious relations with Jews in the Vatican with another document. And you'll notice as we go down the page, decade by decade, that the number of little boxes underneath each document multiplies. 
And I'm not going to read through all of these. You can do it some night when insomnia is affecting you. But you can chart a development, an evolution of thought from the top of the page to the bottom of the page. And not only that, in Catholic ecclesiastical uh, documentation, these documents mutually reinforce one another. So John Paul II, for example, uh, about whose writings on the Jews, there is a volume of about 280 pages that has been published. He will cite the 1974 guidelines. And then the Vatican notes will cite John Paul II when he says something. So there's a cross-fertilization that takes place in these documents. I used to have arrows indicating that, but it became such a morass that you couldn't figure out where the arrows were going. Um, I also want to point out that there has been a trajectory uh, also contributing to this post Nostra Aetate evolving Catholic tradition in terms of biblical scholarship. Uh, beginning in 1943, interestingly, with Pius XII, the Catholic community adopted biblical critical methods for interpreting the Bible. And if you look down the right-hand column, you will see that a number of subsequent documents, particularly by the Pontifical Biblical Commission over the past decades, um, have also contributed to an, a different understanding of Jews and Judaism from a Catholic perspective. Most significantly, the last in the lower right corner, the 2001 study, The Jewish People and Their Sacred Scriptures in the Christian Bible, uh, really has some extremely significant points uh, to be made. For example, it, this document states that the Jewish reading of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the Prophets and the Writings, is a retrospective rereading done through the lenses of the rabbinic tradition over the centuries. It says the same thing about Christian rereadings of the Old Testament, reread through the lenses of the New Testament, also a retrospective rereading, to use their language. But more than that, it goes on to say that Jewish and Christian uh, rereadings are parallel and analogous to one another, so that Jews and Christians can learn an awful lot about God and the experience of God of the other community by talking to one another. So I want to underscore this enormous difference pre and post Nostra Aetate. Before Nostra Aetate, Catholics were actively discouraged from talking to Jews. After Vatican II, virtually every single church document from the Catholic community says, let's dialogue, let's talk. Um, notice under Pope Benedict, in the middle of the page at the bottom, he wrote in a book in 2011, the church ought not to concern herself with the conversion of the Jews. This is a hugely significant statement coming from a pope. Uh, likewise, the Jewish and Christian ways of reading the Bible must dialogue with one another, quote, to learn God's will aright. It's fascinating. I mean, the suggestion is if we don't talk to one another, maybe we're only getting a partial reading of God's will. Uh, this, that's, that's tremendous. Notice Pope Francis um, continues this sort of trajectory in uh, a document uh, that he uh, released in tw the end of 2013, or 2014 rather. God continues to work among the people of the Old Covenant and to bring forth treasures of wisdom which flow from their encounter with his word. A rich complementarity exists between us. I'll say more about that quote later. But this, this sort of shows the, the development from 1965 to 2014, right? If a pope is writing that God is at work in the Jewish community today, bringing forth spiritual treasures, in Catholic parlance, that means the Holy Spirit is at work in the Jewish community. You would never find anybody writing that way before 1965. You'd have the exact opposite as those couple of quotes um, uh, that I indicated at the beginning would suggest. There's a lot packed into this chart. <laughs> Believe me, I know, and there's a few typos too that we've just been finding. Uh, there's no prizes for counting the highest number of them. But um, if you'd flip back to the other side, let me just wrap up this opening uh, segment by reminding us of some things that are happening almost as a commonplace that today that perhaps we take for granted. So for instance, there are joint educational programs and initiatives in every country that has significant Jewish populations. Of course, I think we have a special gift and a special responsibility in the United States because the world's largest diaspora Jewish community lives here, usually or frequently in cities in close proximity to large Catholic communities. And so there's a special opportunity here. 
that I think is important. Academic centers and institutes have been founded at many Catholic universities in the United States and Canada, and also in Europe, but let me focus on our own continent here. Um, and chairs of Jewish studies, voila, are at many Catholic universities, and many Jesuit universities, by the way, which I think we should be proud of. Um, there are books being published that could never have been published in the past, such as something like 60 Jewish scholars publishing a Jewish annotated New Testament. It's chilling, you know, in a, in a very positive way that such a thing can happen. Also a book that um, I was involved in called Christ Jesus and the Jewish People Today, which, which examines the question of how do we as Catholics uh, affirm both Jewish covenantal life with a God who saves and with the universal saving significance of Christ. How do we put those things together? I think we have some, some suggestions that are positive in that regard. Three popes have made pilgrimages to Israel. It's almost expected. Pope gets, gets installed. When's he going to go to Israel? What's he going to do there? What's he going to say? Is he, is he good for the Jews? You know, these are questions that get asked. Uh, nobody would think of those things before. Um, there are uh, the chief rabbi of Rome has been attending funerals and installations of popes. That's certainly a, role, a reversal from the past. Um, bishops speak at yeshivas. Uh, rabbis speak at churches. Bishops are traveling here and there on a fairly regular basis in Jewish communities in the United States. Congregations help one another uh, in physical need. If there's a fire in the synagogue or the church, they, they will help one another out with physical um, facilities. Um, I had an experience that I found amazing, I won't go into detail, this past summer with the, my Jewish colleague at our institute um, delivering uh, or, or guiding a text study at a local synagogue on the, f uh, the day that commemorates the destruction of the temple in the year 70 and also the first temple earlier. Um, a phenomenal experience that, again, is unprecedented. It would never have happened. Uh, and there are friendships developing between Jews and Christians, Jews and Catholics that work together on a regular basis. And in those friendships, and I want to underscore this, in the conversations that occur, people experience the presence of the holy in the other tradition and precisely in the otherness of the other tradition. Cardinal Walter Casper has referred to this experience from a Catholic perspective as like a sacrament of every otherness that the church must learn to appreciate, recognize, and celebrate. It's powerful language there. But once you've detected holiness in the other, I, for example, I had uh, a friend of mine uh, who I happened to um, be at the synagogue after Tisha B'Av, this, this um, commemoration of the destruction of the temple, who was putting on his phylacteries uh, before prayer at the ending of the fast uh, that occurs that day. And just seeing that made me feel the presence of the holy. I'd seen people put on phylacteries, the, the, the um, uh, leather straps that contain um, biblical passages uh, before, but the fact that it was a friend of mine doing this made the, the transcendent more evident to me. And I'm, this is not unique to me. Lots of people that have been involved in this kind of work see this. There are challenges that's, that we have that occur. I don't want to paint a totally rosy picture. There are controversies. There are missteps. But I want to underscore, we have never been able to speak to one another like this in 1,800 years. So of course there's going to be missteps. We have to learn, as Jews and Catholics, how to speak to one another, how not to bring certain expectations that impose our perspective on the other. And I think after five decades, we're starting to develop some skills in that regard. But Issues related to the Holocaust are always going to be problematic. We're talking about a genocide. Of course, they're going to be difficult. And how certain figures during that time period um, be behaved or did not behave is going to be significant. Um, how do we overcome habits we've received from the past when we were hostile to one another? There are many preachers, for example, just to give a Catholic example, but there's issues on the Jewish side as well, but there are many preachers, for example, who are very quick to use the Pharisees or the priests in the time of Jesus as negative foils um, to condemn legalism or to sort of uh, caricature Judaism as not concerned about mercy and the heart, but only with the minutia of the law. And it's sad to say, uh, I'm afraid Pope Francis falls into this, this pattern periodically. Um, 
I think we all have to overcome, I'll say a little bit more about this afterwards, we have to overcome, I think, a zero-sum reflex. From the end of the first century on, we've gotten habituated to the notion that for our, my tradition to be correct, the other tradition has to say something different and be wrong. And the sort of oppositional bouncing off one another is coming to light more and more as historical studies go on. I think a fascinating topic for the future is going to be what, now that we're really talking about profound, deep religious and theological um, topics and experiences, how do we avoid just, to quote a famous writer, an exchange of theological favors? Is it just a reciprocal thing, or is it rather Pope Francis's word complementarity suggesting maybe a way forward? And let me end with a visual um, this, uh, presentation of the before and after. Uh, oops, I hit the wrong button. Cancel that, that. Okay, there we go. So um, one example of the supersessionist worldview that the church had replaced and triumphed over synagogue was seen in many medieval cathedrals, dozens of them in Europe, which used female figures representing ecclesia, church, and synagogue, the synagogue. So for example, here you have the, probably the most famous one, the cathedral at Strasbourg. And you see on your left, church wearing a crown, holding a staff of authority that is surmounted by a cross. She has in her other arm the chalice of the Eucharist and a thoroughly sort of regal figure. Synagoga, on the other hand, has a staff that's broken. She is blindfolded because she doesn't accept the truth of the Christian gospel. Hanging limp from her left hand is a, probably a Torah scroll that's torn and looks like about to fall to the ground. Notice she has no crown on her head. This is a very, very common motif. Another one from a few uh, decades later. Uh, same, same motifs. You can see uh, synagogue. I sort of chuckle when I see this one because the crown is literally in the process of falling off her head. Uh, and instead of a Torah scroll, she has the the tablets of the commandments upside down, almost like we put a flag upside down as a sign of distress, uh, about to fall from her hand. Um, another example from Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, again, church on the left here, crowned, staff of authority, Eucharist. Synagogue, crowned, fallen up, uh, at her left foot, her staff broken in her left hand. Here she is blindfolded by a serpent around her head, recalling probably the serpent of the Garden of Eden, but you can see his head and fangs at the top if you look closely. Um, this is from a Bible miniature, uh, which has the letter Q, with synagogue literally stamping or standing atop of defeated synagogue, who's sort of protesting uh, feebly, I guess, but still protesting, blindfolded in the other trappings you now recognize. Uh, and a little bit later from a, a German Bible history book, Synagogue and Ecclesia at the Cross, which is also a common motif. Synagogue is capturing the precious blood of Jesus in her chalice, so a heuristic motif. Notice Synagogue, crown falling from her head, staff broken. This time a demon is on her head that is causing her vision to be obscured to the truth of the gospel. And lastly, from the before, lest you think this is only medieval, this is from the 20th century, the Boston Public Library, John Singer Sargent, a very famous American portraitist, um, in a uh, series of uh, paintings called The Triumph of Religion, but I think it's probably The Triumph of the Christian Religion. Um, 1919, probably one of the most um, uh, defeated images of synagogue here. She's possibly naked, wrapped up in in either scrolls or maybe the curtain of the temple that's torn when Jesus dies, but clearly a, a totally forlorn and defeated figure. Uh, Ecclesia, on the other hand, majestic, triumphant, transcendent, and so on. Now, we at, at St. Joseph's University want to mark the 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate in a, uh, a, a, a way that is iconic, that grabs people's imagination, that reflects the teaching of the Catholic Church, which would repudiate all of these images that I've just given you samples. And so we've commissioned an artist that will use the feminine figures of synagogue and ecclesia, but instead of one triumphing over the other, these are friends who are learning by studying together. You remember those quotes from Benedict and Francis that I mentioned. 
Uh, we need to st study each other's interpretations in order to appreciate God's word um, aright. So uh, what this is a maquette of the sculpture that will be dedicated this fall. This is, in other words, a clay model about yay big. It's going to look different than this. But you see what we're going for here. They're both crowned, although these crowns don't look like much when they're made out of Play-Doh that big. Um, but holding the Torah scroll proudly as synagogue, church holding the Christian Bible, enjoying the process of learning about God from one another. That's the journey that we've been under uh, on the road with for the past 50 years. Here in the United States, it's a journey that we can continue in a way that other parts of the world are envious of, and that's where I think we're heading. Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Dr. Cunningham for that wonderful presentation from a Catholic perspective. Now I want to call on for... Um, from the Jewish perspective, Dr. David Berg, also an internationally renowned authority, really a scholar on the study of uh, Jewish-Christian relations in medieval times to modern times, uh, a spokesman especially for the Orthodox community, close involvement uh, with uh, leading Catholic figures and in interfaith uh, discussions. So without any further ado, David Berger. So uh, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, indicate uh, how I see the main elements of Nostra Aetate and then uh, comment on a few of them uh, from a uh, Jewish perspective, uh, although I don't know if it's only a Jewish perspective, uh, from my perspective. Um, uh, the key elements as I see them are, uh, one, uh, the church received the revelation of the Old Testament through the Jews and continues to draw sustenance from the root of that olive tree, that is, the Jews. Two, the Jews rejected the gospel but remained dear to God for the sake of their fathers. God does not repent of his gifts. Three, the church wants to foster mutual understanding and respect through fraternal dialogue. Four, the Jewish authorities and their followers pressed for Jesus' execution, but other Jews uh, of the time were not responsible, nor are any Jews today. And finally, five, the church decries anti-Semitism and any form of discrimination based on race, color, condition of life, or religion. Now, I hope to address the developments connected to covenant and mission in the second round, uh, although <clears throat> I need to say right away that all these issues are to some degree interconnected. So what I want to uh, uh, deal with on, in, in this round uh, are uh, three issues. Uh, one, <clears throat> the uh, Jewish responsibility for the crucifixion. Uh, two, the relevance uh, of the uh, document's statement about such responsibility to uh, uh, the church's uh, relationship uh, uh, with an attitude toward the state of Israel. And finally, uh, discussions regarding the appropriate parameters of dialogue. Now, the core statement of Nostra Aetate IV that captured the most attention initially uh, and is, I suppose, theologically the least complex uh, and, uh, and the most straightforward and the least subject to various interpretations uh, is the straightforward assertion that uh, uh, Jews today are not responsible for the crucifixion, period. Uh, not all Jews at the time were responsible and no Jews today are responsible. Uh, now, this, uh, there were uh, pedantic uh, objections initially by some Jews that uh, the word deicide wasn't used, so it didn't say that Jews are not responsible for deicide. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think that that was, should ever have been an issue, uh, and that was in any event dealt with. So, um, the assertion that Jews are not responsible for the crucifixion at all there isn't one Jew today who's responsible, uh, has had a significant impact um, uh, on ordinary 
Christians, not just on uh, uh, the clergy. One of the main issues when you deal with such documents uh, is how much of this goes down to the uh, level of regular people. Uh, the uh, Anti-Defamation League uh, ran a survey in 2012 in 10 uh, Central and Western European countries uh, having to do with anti-Semitism. And most of it is not uh, relevant to us uh, today. Uh, but they, uh, they did include, there were, there were four statements that they thought measure anti-Semitism, and they asked people whether they thought they were probably true or not. Uh, but then they added a fifth question, sort of somewhat separately, uh, namely, uh, uh, the, the assertion was the Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus. Uh, and this, then note the present tense verb. It was not, uh, the, the issue was not whether Jews were responsible, but whether they are responsible. Um, the average uh, in, ten, in those 10 Western and Central European countries of people who said probably true uh, was 22%, ranging from 14% in France and Germany to 46% in Poland. Uh, now, this represents a, a, a real impact. There is absolutely no question that before Vatican II, the number of people who would have said that this is probably true uh, would have been far, far, far higher. Um, uh, note, uh, I didn't say this, that, that uh, the, uh, the number in Spain was, was only 21%, which I thought was very interesting, very low. Um, of course, this is an incomplete impact. Uh, and I note, by the way, that they did not separate Catholics from Protestants, so I have no way of knowing how that broke down. Um, uh, but there's no question uh, that, uh, that the uh, Nostra Aetate assertion uh, that we're looking at now uh, had an enormous impact on, on, on ordinary people. Um, the uh, extent of that impact uh, was really brought home to me uh, during the controversy over Mel Gibson's film on the Passion. Um, that's a long story, and that's not for here. Um, but I did, I did write an article about this. Uh, I, was, I was asked to write an article by commentary, and that forced me to watch the movie, even though I uh, uh, really uh, hesitate to watch any movies with a lot of blood in them. Uh, but I agreed to write an article because I, I had to watch it. Um, during that controversy, um, the uh, head of the Catholic League for Religious and Civil Rights in the United States, who is a conservative Catholic, a named Donahue, uh, was a vigorous defender of the film. Uh, and uh, he wrote a letter to the Jewish community, an open letter to the Jewish community, saying uh, how absolutely wonderful this film is. And in dealing with the uh, concern uh, that someone watching it uh, might uh, become hostile to Jews since Jews are responsible for the crucifixion, this is what he wrote. And I think he you know, was sincere about this. Uh, but even if, even if he wasn't that significant, but I think he was. I'm quoting him. The idea that all Jews at the time of Jesus' death clamored for his crucifixion is historically wrong and patently bigoted. Those who ascribe to notions of collective guilt are demented. The idea that any Jew today is somehow responsible for the behavior of some Jews 2,000 years ago is even more insane." End quote. Now this is a conservative Catholic writing uh, however number of years ago when this film was, uh, was issued. Uh, and he regards the belief that was held by the vast majority of Christians throughout history, uh, and certainly up to the period roughly coinciding with Vatican II, as demented or insane. Uh, now that, uh, whatever one thinks of his view about the film, uh, this is a remarkable example of the degree to which a fundamental change took place 
uh, in, in the psyche of, uh, of uh, very many uh, Christians in general and Catholics in particular. Now, uh, it, it, it happens, uh, Dr. Cunningham mentioned that he can't say only positive things uh, about the situation. Uh, and so I will add that the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops has an Office of Film and Broadcasting, uh, which issued a report, a review of that film. Uh, there is also, or there existed before already, official criteria issued by, this, by the uh, uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops, another, another uh, arm of it. Uh, there were official criteria established for the evaluation of dramatizations of the passion. Uh, the Office of Film and Broadcasting, uh, which gave a pretty favorable review of the film, uh, ignored uh, those criteria entirely. So that, uh, you know, these, these things uh, develop uh, at different uh, paces. Um, nonetheless, uh, I think that that part of the impact of Vatican II is overwhelming and unquestioned. Now, the denial that Jews are responsible for the crucifixion undermined uh, the, uh, and this was pointed out by, uh, by ecumenically uh, uh, oriented Catholics from the beginning just about, uh, undermined the theological basis for rejecting uh, the uh, uh, status of uh, the state of Israel uh, as a Jewish state. In other words, uh, if, if uh, Jews are not responsible for the crucifixion, then they couldn't have been punished for it uh, by exile and, uh, and uh, you know, interminable second-class citizenship. Uh, so that the theological underpinnings of uh, the denial of uh, Jewish national uh, uh, rights in Israel was undermined. Now, that doesn't mean, it, it doesn't follow that Jews, you know, should be given uh, uh, should be allowed to establish a state. That, uh, that's, a, that's a political question. It ceases to be uh, a, a, an issue that is religiously illegitimate or a development that is religiously illegitimate. Now, there was a very long delay after Vatican II uh, before um, uh, the Vatican uh, established diplomatic relations with Israel, uh, and the reasons given for not doing this were, were never even remotely plausible, that there weren't final boundaries, there wasn't a final peace treaty. Uh, uh, whatever reasons there were for not doing it, uh, uh, they, they, they weren't overwhelmingly uh, convincing in light after Vatican II. Uh, but this has changed, and there now are diplomatic relations. Uh, and on the whole, uh, Catholic approaches stand somewhere in between, uh, uh, attitudes toward Israel, uh, stand somewhere in between those of most evangelical Protestants on the one hand, which tend to be very pro-Israel, and many mainstream Protestant groups uh, on the other. Uh, this is not something we can discuss here at this point. And so I, I, I come finally uh, to uh, what, I, what I call the parameters of dialogue. Nostra Aetate calls for fraternal dialogue. For the most part, uh, Jews and Catholics have engaged in such dialogue uh, uh, avidly uh, and without uh, any sort of limitations on subject matter with the exception of the Orthodox Jewish community, which has uh, A, somewhat more reservations about the entire process, but B, uh, uh, substantial reservations about discussing theology. Uh, now, the Orthodox community is a relatively small segment of the Jewish community, uh, but uh, since some of these dialogues take place under the aegis of or involving Jewish organizations that include Orthodox Jews, uh, they have a certain amount of uh, power over the agenda. And so the position of the Orthodox Jewish community does play a, a disproportionate role to their numbers. Uh, and um, here, there is a classic uh, uh, talk and then a written essay by Rabbi Joseph B. Soloveitchik, the most uh, uh, eminent 
uh, rabbinic of uh, modern orthodoxy uh, in the, uh, certainly in the United States, uh, in the 20th century. Uh, uh, he called it confrontation. Uh, and he said, first of all, that discussion of social issues is completely acceptable and indeed desirable. Uh, and on that level, there is an interesting, uh, I guess it's a small irony, and that is that uh, a dialogue between Catholics and Orthodox Jews uh, tends to produce a greater level of agreement about social issues, uh, about non-theological issues, than dialogue between Catholics and non-Orthodox Jews, because there are a variety of issues uh, ranging from uh, abortion, to uh, government support of uh, parochial education, where the views and the interests of those groups tend to uh, coincide more than the, uh, than the beliefs and, uh, and uh, 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 political orientation uh, of Catholics and uh, non-Orthodox Jewish communities. That's, that's just an interesting reality. Um, I think that uh, the primary concern uh, that drove Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, was not uh, the main abstract theological thrust of his presentation, which was that deep religious beliefs can't be communicated, uh, but rather another issue that he uh, raises, and that's a concern about reciprocity, uh, an issue that Dr. Cunningham mentioned, um, uh, in the sense of uh, the trading of theological favors, uh, which Dr. Cunningham said he will transcend uh, uh, through the category of complementarity, uh, that, which, I, which I very much look forward to hearing. Uh, the, um, the concerns uh, that Rabbi Soloveitchik felt about theological reciprocity uh, had, had to do, I think, with uh, the, uh, whether Jew, Jews uh, would be expected uh, to recognize the status of Jesus uh, as a, a redemptive figure for non-Jews, for example. Uh, whether Jews would be expected to reevaluate their uh, assessment of the theological standing of Christianity uh, uh, as, uh, as a kind of foreign worship. Um, uh, the, um, there is an important document that emerged uh, out of, um, you know, that reflects a number of the issues that this entire process triggered uh, by Jews, uh, that's, that was called uh, Dabru Emet, uh, which lists eight areas where uh, Jews can say something important about Christianity. I will not discuss them uh, except with respect to one that I'll get to, I hope, at the second round. But I'll just read you the one sentence or the one phrase introduction to each of these paragraphs. Jews and Christians worship the same God, the document says. Jews and Christians seek authority from the same book, the Bible. Christians can respect the claim of the Jewish people upon the land of Israel. This is a case where they say what Christians can do. Jews and Christians accept the moral principles of Torah. Nazism was not a Christian phenomenon. The humanly irreconcilable difference between Jews and Christians will not be settled until God redeems the entire world as promised in scripture. A new relationship between Jews and Christians will not weaken Jewish practice, and Jews and Christians much, must work together for justice and peace. Uh, at this point, I will only add that um, orthodox resistance to theological discourse is not universal despite Rabbi Soloveitchik's guidelines. The Israeli rabbinate engages in such discussions in a way that uh, U.S. orthodox figures uh, do not. Uh, and uh, uh, there are even some orthodox figures like uh, Rabbi uh, Shlomo Riskin uh, of Israel and Eugene Korn, uh, who has just moved to Israel for most of, uh, of uh, the year, um, have provided a revisionist reading of Rabbi Soloveitchik's position, arguing that given the changes in attitudes towards Jews and Judaism that have taken place since confrontation, which was a talk given during the Second Vatican Council deliberations, uh, that Rabbi Soloveitchik would not have maintained this position 
today. Uh, uh, I responded to this, uh, and uh, I will say that, uh, in my view, uh, this assertion is not true, uh, but uh, uh, the fact that uh, we can disagree about this uh, uh, says something about the realities of some evolution, even within the Orthodox community, uh, even though uh, my understanding of Rabbi Soloveitchik uh, is, of course, correct. Uh, and uh, I will return to some of these issues in the context of covenant. And now, in the interest of time, I've asked of each of the speakers to hold your remarks to 10 minutes, and then we'll have a few minutes of, um, you know, everything we've taken long, and I thought we'll have a few minutes for questions. So thank you. So, thank you, David. Um, uh, it's, um, it's very tempting to, uh, first of all, I don't think I said that I was going to solve the issue of reciprocity. I said this was an agenda for the future, and that... Um, um, the category of complementarity might well be a way to proceed. I do want to say, uh, uh, just to model the kind of conversation that I think is possible today, I do want to briefly say something about Rav Soloveitchik and his interpretation today. Um, but I'm very conscious of the fact that this could rapidly turn into an extremely um, nuanced and uh, esoteric conversation that would put everyone to sleep. So I'm just going to sketch out an inadequate set of, of responses. First of all, I want to say that I don't think it's the place of a Roman Catholic to tell Orthodox Jews what they should do. Um, I, as an outsider to that conversation or to this discussion about how should Orthodox Jews respond to things happening in the Christian community, Catholicism in particular? I'm an interested outsider, and I understand and uh, you know, want to respect that status. I also think that Christians don't really have a moral platform to stand on, uh, on these topics, given the 1,800 years or whatever it is of history. We, we certainly can't say, you know, it's time to do X, Y, or Z, you know. But... <laughs> Uh, since, uh, as a biblical, um, my entree into Christian Jewish relations is through biblical studies, and as I mentioned in passing, the reading of texts in their historical and literary context has become normative for my tradition. Uh, I uh, sort of want to do the same thing for Rabbi Soloveitchik's confrontation, even though it's hardly an ancient text, but nonetheless, um, uh, was situated in a certain time and place. So. I take very seriously, and I'm only speaking for myself, obviously, one of his points, which was the danger that the minority community, the community of the few, has in conversation with the community of the many. The, the over, you know, there's 1.25 billion Catholics in the world. Not that all of them are cramming into one room to have a conversation with the 16 million or whatever the number is. Jews, but, but that disproportionality is something to be taken very, very seriously. On the other hand, the notion that he argued, which I think is contradicted in other of his own writings, that it's impossible to communicate religiously across religious lines or tradition lines, has just proven to be incorrect in the intervening five decades. There's too many people that have indeed profoundly communicated across religious lines, and um, myself included in that. So um, there are those who interpret Rabbi Soloveitchik as being more concerned about who was doing the talking rather than what was being talked about. And that would be an interesting thing I would love to discuss in the context of a, of a dialogue with Orthodox Jews. And I'll, I'll just mention finally, and then I want to say something about covenant, that I think the discussion about Christian-Jewish relations has got to keep an eye on history. And by that I mean, I wonder if it's really true to think about Christianity, let's, let's even make it more narrow, Catholicism and Orthodox Judaism as unalloyed pure categories that have actually not been influencing one another for centuries. To the degree that we have been, for good or for ill, and largely for ill, but not entirely for ill, then it's not as if there has not already been interaction on a social and theological level. And to imagine that there's some pristine form of both, I think is just going outside of the realm of time and space and history. And that has to have an effect. So that 
It's not for me to set timetables. And it's not, it's, I think Christians and Catholics in particular, speaking for my own community, we have to demonstrate over time that we have changed. It's only been five decades in comparison to 1,800 years. We've got a long way to go. But I think it is an inevitable fact of human existence that changes in one tradition are going to have an impact on the other tradition, whether it's desired or not. It's the case of our past history. I don't see why the future should be any different. Therefore, my feeling is, let's take advantage of the opportunity we have for um, non-oppressive conversation as equals to the greatest extent that that, ver that reality can be achieved. I think, I think it's almost a responsibility before God that we have, in my opinion. And I think how we think about covenant relates to this. So yeah, I'll get us to the topic. And that is, um, I think in terms of covenantal theology and Catholicism that we're learning a few things. Maybe it would be interesting to hear, David, what you think about this, but um, one of the, one of the hmm, discussions over the last five decades is whether Catholics ought to think, other Christians should think of the, of the Jewish and Christian reality as two separate covenants with God that sort of don't have any intersection with one another, or whether there's a single covenantal reality that somehow both traditions are subsumed into or are part of in some way. For Catholics, it's almost impossible to answer that question as two separate covenants. And the reason is quite simple and quite um, unchanging. And that is, in the second century, the church decided not to go down the road of someone named Marcion, who said that the God of the Old Testament was a different God than the God of Jesus Christ, and that we ought to ignore all of the books, uh, what became the Christian Old Testament, and just have a Bible that consisted mostly of, of Luke, sort of edited, and excerpts from Paul's letters. It would have a very thin Christian Bible had Marcion prevailed. It would also have been an entirely different religion. We are different because, and in fact, the relationship between Judaism and Christianity is unlike any bilateral relationship in the world between religions because we share some texts together as canonical. Yes, they're in a different order. Yes, there's different traditions of translation and how that transmission has happened over the centuries. But nonetheless, we share bodies of sacred texts, and it is impossible for Catholics to say that our relationship with the God of Israel has nothing to do with Jews, because if we said that, we'd be Marcionites, and we rejected that option. It's just sort of the way it is, as far as I can see it. But I think the problem, if I may say, between thinking in terms of covenants in terms of one or two or three or whatever number, is that I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding in a theological sense of what a covenant is. Covenants originated, as everybody probably knows, in contractual relationships in ancient biblical times. It's a contract, in other words. But over time, uh, and that, that model of contract was applied to the relationship between God and human beings, particularly the people of Israel. But over time, I think a different understanding of covenant has emerged um, in much of Catholic theology, and that is to understand covenant not so much as a contract, but as a relationship. It is a sharing of life together. It is the, the metaphor with marriage is probably as close an analogy as we can get. The difference is that once one is in a relationship with the God of Israel, it's permanent because God is ever faithful. God does not change the connection, the connectedness with the human beings with whom covenant has been entered into. So if one thinks of of covenant not as a sort of simplistic contract or an agreement or an object. I'm trying to pick up an object. Here we go. I possess the covenant, and it can be taken from you, and now we have it and you don't, which was the supersessionist model of the past. If covenant is a relationship, then it is obviously almost necessary theologically that God is in multiple relationships with different groups of people because otherwise we put God in a box and said, God, you can't be in relationship with anybody but us. And neither the Jewish or Christian traditions can tolerate that kind of an approach to things. So my, my understanding of, uh, of covenant, it's not my understanding, but an understanding of covenant that is emerging here is that both Christians and Jews are to be seen as fully involved in a relationship with God, with responsibilities on our parts to 
move the world toward the end that God has in mind for it, namely the reign of God, Olam Haba, uh, the age to come, where God's will prevails over creation. And if we share that understanding of covenant, then um, we have a responsibility both to the world and I think to each other, and I think it gets us around this sort of, I don't know what negative adjective I want to use here, but this sort of um, physicalist understanding of covenant in terms of numbers. It's much more significant than that. Um, and I think, um, frankly, I think Catholics have learned from Jews about that. And um, let's keep doing it. Thank you. In our final presentation, I call upon Dr. Berger for the last time. And then you'll both come up and take a few questions. That sounds very final. It sounds very final the last time, yeah. I, uh, many years ago, I was about to write a, an article that, that I did write. Uh, uh, and I, I spoke to Eugene Fisher, who was then in charge of Jewish, Christian, of Jewish Catholic relations uh, in the United States, uh, just to you know, discuss certain issues. And I said, I'm, I'm, I was asked to write an article on the last decade of Jewish Catholic relations or Christian relations. And he said, I hope it's not the last decade. Um, anyway, so. Uh, let's talk about, about a covenant in the context of Nostra Aetate uh, and how uh, uh, I see it as having been understood um, uh, in subsequent uh, decades. Uh, Nostra Aetate says that God does not repent of his gifts. And it's a quotation essentially from Romans. Um, so, uh, does that mean, uh, does Nostra Aetate mean to say that the Jewish covenant remains in full effect. Um, now, there are strong disagreements among Catholic observers, uh, uh, regard, Catholic scholars, uh, regarding this question uh, and regarding the essential question whether or not Nostra Aetate meant what they would like to uh, regard as the proper approach. Uh, there are full-fledged uh, uh, Theologies that are usually called double covenant theologies, but they don't mean, uh, uh, as you have just heard, uh, nobody means to say that the Christian covenant is not connected somehow with the, with the earlier one because uh, it is certainly rooted in and, rela and related to it. Uh, but the point is that um, uh, the Jewish covenant remains uh, uh, fully salvific, uh, to use a word that would not be used except in this context, uh, for them. Uh, that is, that, uh, that Jews, whatever the speaker means by this, attain salvation uh, through the original covenant uh, without any uh, necessary relationship to, um, to uh, the church. Um, now, We'll get in a moment to the question of what that covenant is that gives Jews uh, salvation. Uh, now, there are those, Jewish and Christian, who regard anything that falls short of this theology in whatever form it takes uh, as uh, uh, to be morally objectionable supersessionism. Then, there is a you know, somewhat uh, uh, less definitive position uh, regarding the Jewish covenant, that says that Jews can be saved without conversion to Christianity. But this is because really uh, anyone can be saved. Uh, um, and that this is a broader theological reality and kind of transcends the Jews, but there is still an effort to somehow treat the Jews as, as special even in this context. Here is a quotation from Cardinal Casper, who was the cardinal uh, in charge of uh, Jewish Catholic relations worldwide, um, is, uh, writing in 2001. He's writing about a document called Dominus Jesus, uh, an important document that was issued the previous year, uh, that um, uh, was understood by some uh, to deny uh, 
straightforward salvation to anyone, including a Jew, uh, who is not a Christian, or maybe even who is not a Catholic. It, it said that uh, salvation uh, is available to anyone, but it's harder to attain for a non-Catholic or non-Christian. Uh, and there were Jews who were upset by this because they, they wanted Jews to have a special standing. Casper, uh, uh, Cardinal Casper wrote as follows. Uh, the only thing I wish to say is that the document Dominus Jesus does not state that everybody needs to become a Catholic in order to be saved by God. On the contrary, it declares that God's grace, which is the grace of Jesus according to our faith, is available to all. Therefore, the Church believes that Judaism, that is the faithful response of the Jewish people to God's irrevocable covenant, is salvific for them because God is faithful to his promises. Now, this is a very interesting statement. Uh, uh, God's grace is available to all. Therefore, the Church believes that Judaism uh, is salvific for them because God is faithful to his promises. There is, there is an interesting, uh, I don't know, uh, problem of transition here between these two sentences. Is there something specifically special about Judaism? Or is Judaism, in the case of Jews, uh, the way to get the salvation that is available in principle to everyone? Now, in either case, there are Catholics who affirm that the continued chosenness of the Jews is expressed through the covenant with Abraham, while others maintain that the Mosaic covenant continues to be in force. Some Jews, again, are insistent that Christians take the latter position. Now, uh, since uh, I am appreciative of, uh, you called me David, I'll call you Phil. Uh, uh, Phil's, uh, I mean, we, we actually do call each other that when we're not in a formal setting. Uh, the, um, uh, I, I'm appreciative and identify with Phil's assertion that uh, uh, an outsider doesn't tell people of a different religion what they should believe in their religion. This is a very strongly uh, held view that I uh, maintain uh, regarding uh, uh, what I have the right to tell Christians. Um, uh, so I don't like this whole business of Jews telling Christians that they have to say that uh, the Mosaic Covenant remains salvific for Jews, or else there, you know, there's something wrong with them. Uh, but I, I, not only that, I, I don't quite know what it means uh, uh, for a Christian to say that the Mosaic Covenant continues to be in force uh, and is hence salvific. Uh, I, I uh, wrote an article about this that Phil has read, uh, uh, where I ask questions that to which I don't have an answer. Does that mean that, uh, that the Jews are obligated to observe the Mosaic Covenant in order to be saved by it? It's hard to imagine that you're saved by a covenant that you don't observe. Uh, does that mean that, that, that Christians are, are uh, expected by some Jews to say that Jews are saved through the observance of the Torah and all its particulars, and if they don't, they're not saved. This is not such a big favor. Uh, uh, and, uh, and in general, it raises questions about the status of the ceremonial law, as Christians called it through the ages, uh, uh, and its salvific force. This is, it's a really very problematic uh, issue. Um, now, what is very important in practical terms uh, given this entire discussion, is the Catholic abandonment of proselytizing with respect to Jews. Uh, whether or not the theology behind this is crystal clear, uh, this is a significant benefit to Jews. Uh, now, there have been some recent uh, uh, blips uh, in this uh, matter, uh, uh, which, shows, uh, which show that... Um, uh, you know, the, the uh, notion that Jews uh, sh uh, should be, uh, you know, attracted to the gospel uh, is not, uh, is not uh, gone. And it's very hard for it to be completely gone because, uh, you know, the uh, efforts to preach the gospel to, to everyone is part of the, uh, of the Christian tradition. Um, uh, but uh, so that there were some statements, and I, I don't have time to discuss them uh, uh, in any detail, but there were uh, the two instances very recently uh, uh, in which, uh, one of which involved an assertion 
uh, by uh, uh, the conference of, of bishops that uh, dialogue contains an implicit invitation to baptism. Uh, and there was a, a statement in the catechism, uh, talking about in the United States, that one of the, mo of the, of the objectives of uh, dialogue, the, the fourth of four, but still one of the objectives is to uh, bring people to the gospel. And when Jews objected, and this is truly remarkable, these statements were taken out. Uh, so on the one hand, it, sh it shows that there are still blips. On the other hand, it shows, I mean, I was, I, I must say, I was shocked, I was stunned when, when uh, the relevant sentence was removed uh, from a document that had just been issued. Uh, but it was. Uh, and that just brings us to the very last thing, and I really do have to stop, and that's the uh, uh, issue of the end of days and, uh, and um, what can sometimes, from my perspective, uh, be a, a kind of relativistic approach to religious uh, truth. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have somewhat more, uh, I think, more... Um, conservative instincts on these matters, uh, and uh, there is a fairly widespread uh, uh, line that some Jews um, uh, like to affirm uh, regarding the end of days. Uh, uh, namely, I don't want to name people who've said this, but the more than one person is supposed to have originated this. Uh, uh, when the Messiah comes, we'll ask him, are you here for the first time or for the second time? Uh, uh, and yes, and one of the people who says he, he invented this, and I don't think he really started it, but he's, uh, I'm sure uh, he's sincere in saying that he's the first person to say it, said that, yeah, that he would suggest to the Messiah that he uh, say no comment. Uh, to which my reaction was, in, in writing, uh, 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 what would he want the Messiah to say to the next question? Uh, are you uh, an incarnation of the second person of the triune God? Would he want him to say no comment? Uh, as from, a, from the uh, instincts of a uh, more conservative type person, uh, I have to say that, uh, that there, is, there are issues of, of propositional truth that do come up in an eschatological context. We have time for a couple of questions, either on what the speaker said, or just in general, Jewish Catholic dialogue uh, uh, relations as we go forward. So if anyone, uh, yeah. My question, thank you both for a very interesting presentation. My question is to Philip, and uh, it's this. Uh, you draw a very stark difference before the Vatican II and after the Vatican II. The thing is, there had to be roots in the pre-Vatican II period for Vatican II to issue the documents that it did. Can you talk about that a little bit? Roots. Um, um, this, is a, this is a really good question. It's a complicated question, so I'm not going to do it justice. And that's what I'll say to every question um, in a short time. But... Um, Nostra Aetate is quite interesting among ecclesiastical documents in the Catholic community because unlike almost every other document, which cites popes and councils and theologians, Nostra Aetate doesn't do that because who do they have to quote to say what they wanted to say in the aftermath of the Shoah? They had to go all the way back to the New Testament. Now, of course, the New Testament is the most authoritative source to go to, so that's not a bad thing. And I think your question, um, in a different form, was actually quite a troublesome one for Pope Benedict. Um, he gave a, t a talk, I don't want to speak over long here, about the proper interpretation of Vatican II and, um, and argued for uh, an, um, hmm, an approach of reform rather than a re an approach of discontinuity between pre- and post-Vatican II. But when it came to talk about Nostra Aetate, his talk was very interesting there. He says, uh, at first glance, it looks like there is a real radical element of discontinuity. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. 
Um, but at a closer inspection, we can see flickers of light amid the darkness. And I think one of the things that he struggled with was to try and find those, those flickers of light between the New Testament and the Second Vatican Council. Cardinal Casper provided him with one in Bernard of Clairvaux. And since then, there's been a couple of others. But these were flickers of light, you know, in, in terms of the practical reality of lived Catholics. Uh, I mean, you could also cite the Council of Trent teaching that uh, Christ died for everybody's sins and so forth. But the practical impact of that on the ground in terms of behavior, you know, was non-existent. So it's... Well, liturgy was a problem, too. Uh, uh, yeah, that's... Talking about the yeah. Jews, and, that, and that was changed before Vatican II. That's true, although very soon before Vatican II, but uh, also the uh, improperia on Good Friday are also highly problematic. But anyway, you know, you're right. The, the, here's what I think is the biggest change, and this is my sort of sneaky way of responding to something that David just said, and that is the biggest change happened in the 1974 guidelines that I have on your chart, which said Catholics must strive to understand uh, the Jewish, how Jews define themselves in the light of their own religious experience, right? So when Jewish commentators can criticize a Catholic document about the Mosaic Covenant and the Catechism that you mentioned, I think it's perfectly appropriate for Jews to say, hey, look, didn't you say that you should understand us in the light of our own self-definition? How come that's not holding true here? I don't think there's any violation of religious lines to hold us to account for what we've said we're going to do. And the fact that we slip up doing that periodically, it's regrettable, but unavoidable, I think. Let me just, and then I'll take one more question. Sorry, let me just uh, pick up on something here. As an outsider, doesn't it seem, it seems to me that there's, you really, you speak in terms of the church. Is there really a church? I mean, you have the American church, you have the English, you have the Polish church. 1939, the American church was preaching something very different about Jews and about this coming war than the German church was, the Polish church was teaching. I mean, you have very different churches. Am I wrong on this? Um, yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be facetious, but, but sure, there, there are different expressions of Catholicism in different parts of the world. Um, the liturgy is one place where there is a kind of uniformity uh, in a certain sense, in terms of the prayers and so on. So, um, you know, when Catholics on Good Friday around the world pray th for the Jewish people to first to hear God's covenant, that they will uh, achieve the fullness of redemption or something to that effect, that's really different than praying for the perfidious Jews that they will be removed from their blindness and come to see the light of Christ. I mean, that's gigantic, and that's around the world. Now, it's going to play out in different cultures in different ways, where there's Jewish communities. It's going to affect differently than in countries where there are no Jews present. Uh, the Whether countries in Eastern Europe were under communist rule for several decades, their experience is going to be really different than Western European countries who didn't suffer under communism in that way. So that's what I mean by yes and no. You know, I've, the chief rabbi of Rome passed away a couple of weeks ago. He's the only figure mentioned, other than Cardinal Ratzinger, in the Pope's will. I mean, this relationship they had was uh, incredible. Any, uh, Which Pope? John Paul? Yeah, John Paul II, yeah. yeah. Um, a, a question regarding, a, on your handout, there's a number of things that you list, uh, Dr. Cohen, and hopefully both of you can respond to it. Um, one of the ones, I think you mentioned all of them, except for the bullet point about overcoming inherited characters and reflex, reflexes. Most pronounced today regarding the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is, uh, as I've said before, this is going to be an inadequate partial answer. But one of the things that's quite interesting is, uh, and my colleague Adam Gregerman is really investigating this, so I'm indebted to him for my reply here to some degree. It's not so much in Catholic documents, but in mainline Protestant documents, there is a kind of pattern that occurs of criticizing the state of Israel for being overly particularistic as a Jewish state and not fully respecting the people Israel's mission before God to be a light to the nations. In other words, for being insufficiently universalistic in the way that it is being Jewish. All right? Now, that trope, of or that theme of comparing 
particularistic Judaism to universalistic Christianity goes back to the patristic era. That's what I mean by uh, that sometimes when Christians are arguing about the political decisions and policies and events that occur in the Middle East, they sometimes unconsciously are tapping into these ancient polemics without necessarily realizing it let alone violating the principle I just said about hearing how Jews define themselves in the light of their own religious experience. Again, that's a very partial answer, and I'm not accusing Christians of doing this of being anti-Semitic. I, mean, I want to make that clear. But we do, I think, have an inherited tendency to view Jews according to Christian categories, and that's what it's going to take time to unlearn. Uh, I would just say on that particular point uh, that uh, this issue goes back quite a few decades. Uh, and the way uh, I uh, put it, uh, I once put it this way in, in writing, uh, is not so much, and I have to think about you know, the formulation we just heard, uh, not so much that it imposes a Christian universalistic uh, perspective uh, uh, on Jews who are seen as particularistic, so much as that it makes prophetic demands of the state of Israel of a sort that are not made uh, on any other state. Because uh, somehow the very fact that Israel is Israel, with all of its theological uh, uh, resonance, uh, creates a, a religious demand uh, on Israeli behavior uh, that is not uh, applied to other countries. And when this demand is then translated uh, into ordinary political contexts, then uh, Israel tends to be held to a standard uh, that uh, uh, makes it appear uh, to be unusually defective morally when those defects really result from uh, a demand of almost transcendently ideal behavior. Uh, I, I just want to take the opportunity to say one other thing uh, about a different matter, uh, and that is I talked about, the, about uh, uh, eschatological um, relativism. Uh, there is a, I was going to talk about this, and I, I just didn't have time to do it, so I, that means I don't have time now either, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but it's in your, it's in your uh, quotations on that right column at the very bottom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I am absolutely overwhelmed, uh, and, and I don't know what to call it, uh, uh, by the assertion uh, in that official document that the Messiah, when he comes, will have the traits of Jesus yeah. of Nazareth. What does that mean? Yeah. Uh, does that mean that the, the Catholic Church is not asserting that the Messiah will be Jesus of Nazareth? Be somebody with the traits of Jesus of Nazareth? I, I just, I don't understand that. And if you can explain this to me, I want to hear the explanation. <laughs> so, so my facetious answer is to give a different response to your joke. Okay. Uh, or the joke, whoever it is, about you know, what, what the Messiah comes and the questions that are asked. Uh, my take on this, based on this PBC document statement that you're referring to, but it would take too long to unpack, would be that when the Messiah comes, nobody's going to be asking those kinds of questions. Oh, final question. And since we're final not there, comments. we can say whatever we want about the eschatology. One more question. Fine. Comment. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm a minister of the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, and I disagree quite a bit with it. Uh, could it not be, you're talking about the celebratory issue dealing with Vatican II and such, uh, the, the change of attitude toward the, the deicide issue, fabulous. I, many of us are concerned about, could not Israel itself, the land, be that piece now that's going to either move us further forward or not? And I'm talking about as mainliner uh, and within the Protestant church. I'm not sure exactly how the Roman church is dealing with it. Uh, but uh, I think back in my denomination, in uh, the late, I think it was 1987, we put together uh, a, a, yeah, uh, on uh, the relationship between Jews and Christians, and one of those seven or eight pieces was the love of the, or the appreciation of the land. Now, of course, in my opinion, we've, we've gone far afield of that. 
sadly. Okay, but it seems to me that to really continue true dialogue, there's, there's gotta have, we're going to come to terms with with Israel as a as a as a be you know it's there and to, to be respected, whatever the word is in terms of the future. I mean, uh, there's no question that in in practical terms. Uh, the most vexed issue now uh, does have to do with Israel. Um, uh, my attitude toward this question has always been, and this is connected with covenant, I think, uh, has always been, as I indicated, that Jews have no business telling Christians what they should uh, believe about, uh, about uh, just about anything uh, and, uh, and, un unless it, it, it really causes uh, severely detrimental consequences to Jews, in which case saying something is a form of self-defense. Now, I originally said that in connection with missionizing. Maybe there I have the right to try to persuade Christians uh, that they shouldn't try to missionize Jews because that's a kind of self-defense, even though I'd be telling them what to believe about their own theology, and I, I, and I was really been torn about that. The, the fact that uh, some Christians hostile to Israel have uh, begun to argue uh, that uh, the uh, belief that the Jews still have a covenant with God that could affect the land is a theological error and there, there, there is a serious uh, 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 sector of the Christian uh, anti-Israel community that has begun to make that argument uh, has caused me to wrestle again with the question of whether over here I have any you know, right to, to at least propose uh, to Christians that they should understand their own theology in a way that does not lead to that conclusion. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it's a case where I really am torn uh, over uh, of what I uh, do and do not have the right to say to a Christian. Please write it in commentary. So, if I could just give a, a quick uh, comment in addition to that. I think, I think it's important to keep in mind, particularly for Christians, that our theology of our relationship to the Jewish community is a work in progress. Right? We're doing something that has never been done before, quite literally. And, and I think everybody that comments on this needs to keep that in mind. Add to that the existence of a nation state that self-identifies as a Jewish state. This raises a host of problems ir irrespective of the one I just mentioned, namely the unprecedented nature of what we're doing, in that how in the contemporary world are religious traditions to make sense of the foundation of a state that calls itself Jewish. And Jews have this problem too. This is not unique to Christianity. Jews also are trying to make sense of what does it mean that there is a Jewish state and does it have religious significance? Did God cause it, for example? Or is the proper question, now that there is a Jewish state, how does that affect how we live Jewishly? I mean, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, there's a certain wisdom, I think, in a, a, a remark that a cardinal was, uh, that made back in 1968, right after the 67 war, when a reporter asked him, do you think that the hand of God is at work in the victory that the state of Israel had over the armies that were surrounding it and so forth? And his answer was a very Catholic answer. His answer was... This is a really puzzling question, and we think we're going to have to wait about 100 years in order to make sense of it. There's a lot of wisdom in that, and, and, and there has not been sufficient time, I think, for Jews to come to grips with that question, let alone outsiders. So, thank you. I, 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 say one more sentence. I, I, mean, I, I, I do want to say, and I have the right to say what I should believe about uh, in Judaism. Uh, it is certainly true that there are deep divisions among Jews regarding the theological significance of Israel, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, religious uh, uh, Zionist community, or whatever you want to call it, uh, takes a position that seems to me to be almost impossible uh, to reject. 
And that is that the notion that the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel uh, as uh, sovereigns, uh, the notion that that return has nothing to do with God uh, is uh, a highly problematic position. And just regarding Israel, I'll just call your attention, there's a cartoon that's going around right now uh, saying, uh, how come the world isn't condemning Israel's latest disproportionate response? And then you turn the page and it's uh, 30% of the foreign doctors in Nepal, as we speak, are from Israel. Okay, thank you all for coming out.